Please take a moment to read over this slide. So the title for today's webinar is Active Learning Cell-Free Protein Production Optimization. Thank you to Beckman Coulter Life Sciences for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, for more than 80 years, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences has been a trusted partner for laboratory professionals, helping to advance scientific research and patient care. Uh, we have Olivier Borkowski presenting with us today. Olivier is a molecular physiologist and microbial bioengineer working on model bacteria and yeast. Olivier's scientific interest from his PhD to his current work focuses on the relationship between cell physiology and gene expression. During his PhD, he worked on B. subtilis to understand the impact of growth rate on protein production using a systems-oriented approach. Then during his postdocs, he focused on the impact on protein production on the growth rate and a method was developed to predict the cost of heterologous protein production using cell-free systems, in vitro expression, and models of the translation process. We also have Sohela Beck. Sohela is the Echo Commercial Product Manager of Genomics for Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Prior to this role, she has been a senior field application scientist supporting the genomics and drug discovery applications for LabSite and other liquid handling, and automation companies. Additionally, Sohela has held roles at Illumina and Scripps Research Institute. She has a PhD in analytical chemistry from Michigan State University, where she did her graduate work on crystallography of macromolecules. She also has done a postdoc at University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, where she worked on studying TN5 trans transposase. And, and with that, I'd like to introduce Olivier. Okay. okay, so I hope you can all see my presentation now. Uh, Amani, can we see everything? Yep, I can see your slides. Oh. Uh, I cannot hear you, but well, I suppose you, you can see the presentation now. Um, so, uh, this work was uh, so. Uh, so wait a minute. Uh, let me just be sure. Reading very fast. Okay. So I the, the work I would present you now is uh, a system a method that we use coupling machine learning and self-free expression in order to maximize self-free expression for homemade cell lysates and also be able to predict accurately protein production in cell-free uh, expression. So this work was done uh, in the lab of Jean-Luc Follon at Inmai, uh, in the Paris area. So this is a, a very quick presentation, but you probably already know what cell-free is, but the cell-free expression system, also called transcription, translation system, is uh, based on cell lysis. And what I use to make this cellized is the uh, ecolab culture that I then complete with several uh, buffers, uh, NTPs, amino acids that I will describe you later, in order to directly produ produce protein from uh, DNA. So the protein I produced in this work was a fluorescence protein, but you can produce all kinds of proteins. There is a, a few advantages and application of a cell-free system, so it's fast uh, to produce. You just have to put, mix your DNA with the, the reactions, and you will have quick protein production. You don't need to transform any cells. Uh, you have no interaction with living host, no burden, no mutations. So you can test circuit genetic circuits very easily. There is decoupling effect. It simplifies the system, so you just study the protein expression. In your system, you have very low volume from 10 microliters, so this is what I did in this work, but you can also go to one microliter reaction, and it's working very well, and you have higher control on what you want to do. You can put as much DNA as you want. Uh, you don't have to rely on the origin of replication here. You directly put a concentration of DNA, and you know what you express, and you can also, you would see, change the cell-free reaction. And eventually, it's not what I did here, but you can also work with linear DNA. 
So nowadays, there is a very efficient uh, protocol described in the literature, especially one from the Vincent Mao labs, in which they show how to get uh, lysets from cell culture and then what component, compounds to add to the reaction in order to produce proteins from DNA. So there is a few steps, they simplify the steps. You just grow your culture to exponential phase. Then you wash your culture, you can sonicate or use a French press or even chemical reaction. But what I did in this work is use sonication because it was the simplest one I had that was available for me. Then you wash the solution, centrifuge, incubate for an hour, centrifuge again, and you have your lysette. So it's quite simple, but still, you see that uh, there is still a lot of steps, and then that can bring uh, different composition to your final lysates, depending of where you do it and who is doing it. And so at the end, depending of who did it and where they did it, you will have different compositions that will affect uh, protein expression in cell-free. Then you add a lot of compounds, so in fact, uh, uh, 11 compounds to your reactions, and depending on the cell free composition, so you will have different level of expression. And so what we wanted to achieve in this work is first to be able to correctly predict protein expression from uh, a given home male lysette, and also maximize production whatever the person or whoever, or whoever the person uh, doing it. So here you, you can see the, the different compound components that we add to the cell free. And, um, and so what we, we started to do is to use the concentration that were described in the initial paper. Then we took 50%, 30%, and 10% of this concentration for each compound in order to have a, a combinatorial space to explore. So we had uh, four concentrations, 11 compounds, which bring us to 4 million different possibilities. So we didn't measure all of them. But you can see that it's already a very large space of exploration. And we were wondering, is it possible also to improve protein production by decreasing the concentration of the compounds or by changing this expression? And can we obtain uh, high efficiency uh, prediction for protein production based on the composition, so before changing it? And also, can we find the critical parameters that impact protein production in, uh, in vitro, in cell -free? So first, uh, we defined what we wanted to measure. Uh, so that was uh, connected also, uh, obviously, to the uh, fluorescence uh, level. Uh, but we wanted to compare, uh, we wanted to be sure to compare slates between days accurately. So we have different control, and we defined an element called yield, which is the fluorescence uh, of our reactions. So we were always using the same plasmid at the same concentration. So we just remove autofluorescence because the reaction has some autofluorescence, and we divide it by what we call the reference fluorescence, which was the fluorescence level uh, at maximum concentration of each compound. And we just did the division, what we call yield. So as uh, it was um, a lot of uh, different uh, compositions that we wanted to test, uh, 4 million different, it was not possible to measure all of them. So we relied on an active learning approach. Uh, for, to do that, uh, we automatize, semi-automatize uh, the reaction. So we used the machine learning uh, algorithm, 25 models that were able to predict based on measurements uh, what protein production will happen with a given composition. So what's happened is that we started with an initial training set, then feed it to our machine learning models, give the instruction to the echo acoustic liquid handler that distributed all our compounds in each well, in a 384 well plate. Then we incubate overnight. We had fluorescence that we measure with the plate reader. We feed the data to the model and we continue those cycles of uh, expression. So the purpose was to find the maximal, the best composition to maximize protein production, but also to explore uh, unknown area of the combinatorial space in order to maximize prediction at the same time. 
So when we started the experiment with the initial training set, what we did is that we used so 102 composition in triplicates, and uh, in this 102 composition, there is 80 random composition, the 22 fixed one. So the, the fixed ones, they are uh, extreme composition. So one is the maximum concentration for all, minimum concentration for all, and then uh, every time we took maximum concentration for one compound and minimal for the other, and the opposite, minimal concentration with maximum concentration. So the idea was to have a subset of extreme reactions and then the other one random. So the advantage here of the ECHO machine, it was not possible to do the, the, the project without it because uh, for each round of measurement, we had around 4,000 pipetting to do and we had to take very small volume for each compound. So here it was necessary to have uh, this low volume transfer that was possible with the machine. And the next thing that we wanted to, that was critical for the experiment is to have a quick distribution uh, of all of the compounds in order to have all our reaction to start at the same point. So here it was possible to distribute a full plate in less than 30 minutes. So it was perfect for, for the experiment. And so we did several rounds of iteration of this uh, automa semi-automatic uh, process. And we managed to, over several rounds, to increase the yield by 30 times, which was uh, not expected, but was very, very appreciated <laughs> for the project. And um, we, after seven iterations, we were not able to increase it anymore, even if we went away from the best predicted found. So, so the model was giving us both the best composition to obtain, but also some area which was badly predicted. So we tried to move, uh, to, to force, we forced the model to explore so unknown areas and still we, we didn't manage to get better production than 30 times increase in yield. So we assume at the end that we, were, we found the maximum yield with our given home cell lizards. And here you can see uh, the accuracy of the prediction over the different iterations. So at the beginning, at the first iteration, we had a really bad prediction. So what I call prediction accuracy here is the R square of the prediction versus the data measurement at every iteration. And so you can see that in the beginning it's very bad, then you have a, a nice increase, and over the iteration you increase until you reach uh, R square around 0 0.9 after seven iterations. And so at this point, even when you go in different composition, you always have a very nice uh, predictability. And here you can see also that there is a standard deviation uh, on each prediction, and this is because uh, we both have, well, we have triplicate, but we also do 25 prediction at the same time uh, when we feed the model. So there is the same neural network, but 25 times, uh, that, and that gives us uh, the accuracy of the prediction. So then uh, we, so with this first experiment, with first step of experiments, we explore a thousand different compositions and out of the four million possible composition. And we, with the thousand ex expression level and thousand different compositions, we were able to find out which components were the, the ones that impact the most protein production. And we saw that some of them impact them a lot, like MG glutamate, glutamate or amino acids, or NTPs, but some others, like the tRNA, NAD, or, or folinic acid, doesn't impact that much. They are important for the reaction, but if you change their concentration, it doesn't change anything. So at this point, we knew what kind of uh, compounds uh, were the most important in the reaction, and they are mainly the ones uh, connected to uh, translation or energy uh, regeneration. And so when you see the thousand compositions that we tested, uh, what is important too is that some of the compounds that have a critical impact on protein production have a positive impact or a negative one. Uh, what I mean by that is that for NTPs, for example, we saw that the most you put the best it is, but for 3PGA, for example, if you put too much of it, 
it becomes to be negative for protein production. So, and you can see here that uh, some of them they have a completely random distribution uh, depending of the. So, on the right, you go to the highest yield, you have the thousand different composition, and if it's red, it's high concentration, and green, low concentration. Okay, so when we found that, we saw that we can have very nice prediction. We can really increase the yield by changing composition with a given homemade cell like this. But we don't want to, we wanted to give a method to other people that was not based on a thousand reaction to do every time you want to maximize production uh, in cell free with your own home cell like that. So we find out uh, a set of compositions that were the most informative in order to train the same model as us. So we found 20 compositions that if you measure them and fit the model with it, you will have very high prediction efficiency. With the first, with our thousand, uh, um, thousand with our own, own self omens uh, cell laser. So we had this uh, set of composition, we had our model, and what we did is that, uh, okay, so we did a method to, to test that this approach was the right one. So we have 20 composition to train the model, and then we test this training with 82 new compositions. So here it's just one iteration. The idea is that you have, you have tested your laser, you have trained your model, and now we test with 82 other compositions if the prediction are right. And so the idea here is that we will test a lot. We tested a lot of different homemade lizards and check if our method was the right one. So this first set is uh, three lizards. The first one is the original one, so the one we used before. Then there is two others using the same strain of E. coli, but did by two other uh, scientists and PhD students in the lab. So Whatever here the, the the origin of the cell is it, with our approach we had a very good prediction. So here you see in the x axis x axis the predicted yield, in the y axis the measured yield. The purple points are the 20 compositions that are were used initially to train the model, and the green one are the 82 new compositions used to test uh, that the prediction are good and you always obtain a R square of a very high value. Then we pushed it a little more. First, we explore if what, what was the critical compound with each of those, uh, those slides. So the first one I already showed you, and the two others, we can see that it's the same compound that affects strongly the yield, but in a different manner. So for example, uh, for the first slide, the NTPs were really important, and it was a little bit less important for the last one. So this probably depends on the composition of the lizard. There is probably more NTPs remained in the last lizard than there is in the first one, and so this has different impact on the final protein production. So then we, we pushed it a little bit more. So we used um, the original lizard first, but supplemented with antibiotics one that impacts the transcription, and one that impacts the translation. And eventually, uh, we also used uh, LIZET based on another strain of, of E. coli, the dh 5 And we saw that when we add novobiocin, so when we impact the transcription, the prediction, our method is working still very well, but when we used uh, an antibiotic that impact translation or another strain, we had less of a good uh, prediction level. But in fact, what we observe with those two is that we have less diversity in uh, protein expression, so we seem to, to damage a lot of protein production with the antibiotics that affect transcription and with the other strain. And in this situation, we kind of have a cloud of the same yield of, uh, same level of expression, and so our prediction is not as good. Here is, a, is another representation of the, the same data. So on this one, I show in the x-axis predicted versus the measured. And here, I compare every, every measured 
uh, yield to the original lizard. So in the x-axis is always the same one, the, the first lizard I used, and in the y-axis is the measured lizard in all different uh, other lizards. Just to show you that they really behave differently. Uh, so the, the first one, the P, so the PS lizard is very similar to the original one. The AB one, so they, they are the, the lizards using the same strains, but different users, and they show similarities. The Novobiosin ones show the more um, di differences, and when you add spectinomyces or DHL alpha, you see that, in fact, what is happening is that whatever composition you put at some point, you saturate your yield. So even if you try to improve production when the translation machinery is damaged with the spectinomycin, you cannot improve anymore your production. And with the DH5-alpha, you have the same pattern. So it seems that this strength is less efficient in translation. And this is not absurd because the DH5-alpha is a strength that is mostly used for cloning, when BL21 is a strain of E. coli that is used for protein production. So it's possible that with DH5-alpha, you have less, in terms of quantity, you have less production of ribosomes, for example probably, and so but here the translation is less efficient, but this is just a hypothesis. Uh, here it's uh, another representation, it's just um, show you what I call the general yield. So when I show you in the first slide how, in the third slide how we calculate the yield, it's always relative, so it's uh, the fluorescence with a given composition divided by the fluorescence with what I call the reference uh, composition. And here, it's a kind of absolute one, so I always divided the fluorescence by the same uh, reference value, which was the fluorescence measure with the reference composition with my original lysis. So it's in order to, in order to have a, a comparison with the original lysis. And it's just showing you that for the, when you add antibiotics to the system, you really damage the production. But Apparently, with the uh, novobiocin, you can still improve it, which is not the case with spectinomycin. And what is interesting here, too, is that with DH5-alpha, I, I still have a very high yield. It's just that I saturate at some point. So I can improve it by changing in the beginning the composition, but very early, I, I saturate. So it's probably that even if there is not such a strong translation, the translation still to compensate but cannot be uh, improved by a change in composition. So based on these results, uh, the, the, the interesting result, what we obtain and what we did use from this work is that you can always improve your homemade cell-free reaction and there is some high margin of improvement. So for us, it was 30 times higher by changing the compositions. So the initial composition was not the optimal one for this particular, particular omega cell free reactions. We are able with the machine learning approach to a very nice prediction. And so with our new method, we show that you just need 20 compositions to train correctly the model and then a very nice prediction, whatever cell free composition you make. But this is not as efficient when you have a very bad home cell, home lysate that has a very bad translation efficiency. We also highlight the critical parameters involved in protein production. So there is some compounds like MTPs that are really important. We also provide this one-step method to maximize protein production. And uh, based on uh, the antibiotics that we use and the different cell lines that we use, we we are able to put the hypothesis that we mainly improve translation by changing the composition optimization. So the next step would be that would be interesting to explore. It's to have um, the BL21 supplemented with the T7 polymerase in order to maximum tra maximize transcription with this polymerase and then maximize translation with the, the modification in cell recomposition. And now, also, uh, another interesting uh, perspective with this method is that as long as you use the same compound to maximize protein expression, you can apply this method to other bacteria uh, 
based cell-free system like Subtilis or Vibrio Natrigens, which are using the same compounds uh, for cell-free expression. So now I will be happy to answer questions. Uh, this work was done, like I said, in Ria with uh, my co-first author, Mathilde Bush, and in the lab of Jean-Louis Follon, with the help of the lab of Fabrice Agou at the uh, Institute Pasteur. That's why I saw that there is already a uh, question. Uh, so I will try to answer it now. So how do we analyze the home cell laser from the presence uh, of necessary components? Uh, so, so that is um, the one-step method that, uh, that I use. So I directly uh, measure those 20 compositions. And based on that, you can already have an idea of what is missing in your cell free. Or at least you will have the machine learning telling you what is the best final comp composition to, to do. And so you will see if you have to put a very important amount of amino acid, for example. This will, give for, for some, this will give you some indication of what is missing. Uh, so I didn't try for the second question. I didn't try on eukaryotic lysets because, in fact, the, I, so I think that the method, the machine learning approach will work. But it's very different composition. It's not using the same uh, compounds like uh, um, NAD or there is still NTPs and amino acid, but the buffer are not the same. And so I'm not. Sh I, I don't have the the information of the 20 uh, very informative informative compositions. So if I want to do it with the karyotic cells, I will have to go through the thousand measurements again. Uh, Pardon, thank the you. The meter uh, can be codon optimized. In fact, uh, for the whole experiment, I used um, my own vector, but uh, the company, um, uh, I contacted the company that gave me another vector that was way more efficient. So clearly, there is some. Uh, I worked mainly on the optimization of the cell free, but you can also work in parallel on the optimization uh, of the vector. Thank you, Olivier, for uh, presenting on your, your, mater on your well, material here. Uh, as he has mentioned, we do have some, uh, we are doing Q&A for his part of the webinar. So please do send your questions in. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to open up the polling questions, and uh, please do take a moment to fill that out. And uh, if you have questions for Olivier uh, going forward, uh, we'll be happy to uh, reassess those after Sohila presents on her on, on her material. So currently, I'm not seeing any more questions for Olivier, so I'd like to hand it over to Sohela to start presenting. Thank you, Armani. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Armani, and thank you, Olivier, for that great talk. Olivier talked about how Echo Liquid Handler is enabling their cell free protein expression systems. In the second part of the talk today, you will learn how equiliquid handlers are used in a variety of synthetic biology applications. But first, let's have a quick introduction to Beckman Coulter Life Sciences and learn about the overall product offerings. Beckman Coulter was founded by Caltech professor Arnold Beckman in 1935 and joined Danaher Corporation in 2011. Here at Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, we make and support a range of instruments for research use, from liquid handlers to cell counters and centrifuges to flow cytometers. I'm sure a lot of you already know the Beckman brand through our famous centrifuges, common in a lot of labs. Along with that, we manufacture and support a range of high-quality reagents and consumables, which deliver high-performance in a variety of assays from genomics to cell viability and flow cytometry. We also manufacture a lot of our own labware, including tips and macro titer plates. 
With recent acquisition of LabSite, now Bitman offers a wider range of liquid handling solutions, from nanoliter to milliliter, using a combination of eco-liquid handlers and Biomac i5 or i7 workstations. Echo product lines are great for lower volume transfers between 2.5 nanoliter to 5 microliter and Biomac workstations for larger volume transfers from 0.5 microliter to 5 milliliter. As mentioned by Olivier in his talk, Echo is used in their lab for self-reporting expression reaction setups. What we have seen in recent years is that Echo is increasingly becoming a workhorse in mid to high throughput synthetic biology labs for a variety of applications, which we will discuss in more details in the next few slides. So how does the ECHO work? The heart of the ECHO technology is a transducer that generates low energy ultrasounds, which are focused on the meniscus of the liquid in the source wells to shoot 2.5 or 25 nanoliter droplets, depending on the model of the ECHO, to the wells of a destination plate, which is inverted on top of the source plate, as you see in the picture here. ECHO does this very fast and accurately at a fast flow rate of up to six microliter per second. ECHO uses a unique technology called dynamic fluid analysis, which means it can adjust the transfer parameters in real time for variety of liquids. This means variety of samples and reagents such as DNA, RNA, master mixes in glycerol or storage solutions at different concentrations can all be transferred without any user calibration. All a user needs to do is to select the right liquid calibration from a short predefined list. By transferring from microliter to nanoliter on ECHO with high accuracy and precision, the ECHO enables reducing the reaction volumes and therefore reducing costs while maintaining high data quality. As Olivier mentioned, they did 10 microliter, but you can go down to one microliter reaction easily. The ECHO comes in variety of flavors. ECHO 525 transfers 25 nanoliter and above of aqueous solutions at a fast rate of up to six microliter per second. ECHO 650 transfers 2.5 nanoliter and above of both aqueous and DMSO solution. ECHO 655 is similar to ECHO 650 in terms of transfer volume, but does the transfers at much faster rate. Both the, the ECHO 650 and 655 have an upgrade path to transfer solutions from a storage source tubes instead of the plate to make an easier workflow. As you can imagine, the echo liquid handlers offer a very fast automation solution. And therefore, for high throughput labs, there is a need for having plate handling and integration solutions around the echo to feed the plate to the echo and other devices. Here at Beckman, we offer modular, flexible, and a scalable integration solutions called access systems, which enable true walk away reliable and high throughput workflows. ECHO has a very friendly user interface software. ECHO CherryPick or ECHO Plate Reformat software both allow for uploading pick lists for the assembly reactions or setting up variable amount of reagents during a self-free protein expression reaction setup. A pick list allows for dictating the transfer pattern from any well in the source plate to any well in the destination plate. As mentioned, these transfers are fast. For example, a tip-based liquid handler may take up to six to eight seconds for each of these transfers. But for, for ECHO, because it is tipless, it's very fast and less than a second. Therefore, ECHO can set up gene assembly reactions or set up optimization reactions like what Olivia showed much faster than any tip-based liquid handler. ECHO plate reformat also allows for very easy and straightforward drag and design kind of plate reformatting for simple reaction setups, such as qPCR or any NGS application. As I mentioned before, Beckman Culture Life Sciences now offers nanoliter to microliter dispensing capability of the ECHO 
and microliter to milliliter dispensing capability of the Biomac with one support system. With direct integration of the ECHO and Biomac, as shown in the picture here, for an ECHO 525 and Biomac i5 workstation, faster, low-cost, and high throughput sample processing are achieved by combining the speed and low volume, accuracy and precision of the echo acoustic technology with the flexibility of Biomax i series workstation. In such platforms, the gripper arm of the Biomac will hand over the plates from the echo to Biomac and devices and vice versa. Now let's take a look at different synthetic biology applications that echo is used for in order to enable more efficient, faster, and cheaper workflows. In a typical gene assembly workflow, ECHO can help with very fast and low volume pooling of the fragments and adding the master mixes, setting up the gene assembly reactions. After the assembly and transformation, ECHO can easily array the transformed cells in the culture to get single colonies. ECHO has been essential with any optional QCS steps such as colony QPCR or NGS to reduce the cost of the reactions and increase the speed for such workflows. ECHO can also be essential in downstream functional testing to miniaturize the reaction volume for cost saving and optimize the speed for optimization reactions, for example, in cell-free protein expression systems that we just talked about. A great, a great example of ECHO being used with common gene assembly kits to miniaturize the reaction volume and save on cost per reaction is shown in a paper by Patrick Kai and his group. They have shown when miniaturizing the reaction volumes for either Gibson or Golden Gate assemblies, they see an increase in assembly efficiency while reducing the cost. For example, for Gibson assembly going from 20 microliter down to one microliter, as shown on the left, they got better efficiency at one microliter while reducing the cost from $2.50 per reaction to only a few cents. The same was observed for Golden Gate chemistry with maximum efficiency of the reaction observed at 500 nanoliter. So, so far we talked about the cost savings of ECHO through miniaturization of reaction volumes, but I would like to highlight the time savings based on data from Amiris Biotechnologies and other customers. The ECHO has been proven to save about 15 hours in a typical workflow that would have taken 18 hours. So, for example, if an assembly takes 12 hours on a tip-based liquid handler, it will only be three hours on ECHO and pooling and normalization of an optional NGS QCS step will go from six hours down to only 12 minutes. This will enable creating a lot more constructs, not only at much lower cost, but also much faster. And that is why the ECHO has been adopted by a lot of high throughput symbiotic companies working on these type of applications. When it comes to arraying colonies after a transformation, ECHO can be a great enabling tool for high density and high throughput automated colony arraying onto media and agar plates. Hundreds of petri dishes can be replaced with one densely spotted SPS standard plate filled with media and agar. The method of dispensing these colonies using ECHO is less error prone than typically liquid handlers due to non-contact dispensing. And I should say these images are from one of our great customers that provided these to us. By the way, did you know ECHO can create masterpieces? Folks at Jeff Boca's lab at New York University have used their ECHO to create these beautiful art pieces by dispensing colored yeast on SPS LV agar plates. You can see more amazing work like this on eastart.org. As mentioned by Olivier, ECHO can be a very enabling tool for setting up cell-free transcription translation reactions, which are very versatile platforms for production of recombinant proteins with synthetic biology, within synthetic biology. 
The very fast, accurate, and precise low volume uh, from nanoliter to microliter transfers of reagents and DNA pieces by the ECHO allows for up to 10 times faster reaction optimization while lowering the reagent consumption and cost by at least threefold, but often a lot more, depending on how low in volume you go compared to tip-based liquid handlers. We were uh, lucky that some of the customers um, provided these great testimonials about mm -hmm. ECHO. Uh, one of them is from a JALO paper saying, we were able to successfully downscale PCRs and the popular one-pot DNA assembly methods, Golden Gate and Gibson assemblies, from the microliter to nanoliter scale with high assembly efficiency, which effectively cut the reagent cost by 20 to 100 fold. We envision that acoustic dispensing will become an instrumental technology in synthetic biology, in particular in the era of DNA foundries. Another one from one of uh, other great customers of ours, the ECHO 525 automates complex liquid aliquot rearray at high speeds and at miniaturized scales, saving significant time and money. It has proven to be extremely versatile and robust. My team have used it to set up PCRs, self-reporting synthesis reactions, and biochemical assays, and even to array colonies of transformed bacteria on solid media. At ANZA, the ECHO 525 is the workhorse for our automated DNA assembly platform. So I want to end by saying, at Beckman Calder Life Sciences, we offer a full product solution, from the instruments to reagents and software, all with the same great engineering and application support team from one company, to make sure we are a supporting partner in your research journey and endeavors. With that, I would like to pass on to Armani and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sahila, for all presenting. I would like to remind everyone that it is now the Q&A session, and uh, we'd love to take some questions for some both Sohela and Olivier uh, to answer. Um, to start us off, I do have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. I believe one is for Olivier. Uh, do you think your approach can work with other proteins? So, yes, it's definitely working. Uh, the thing is just that if you need any cofactors or if your protein is more difficult to fold, you will probably have to add some things a little bit in the composition. But the, the 20 composition method to optimize production, at least, will be working as easily. All right, thank you. I don't oh, know. Uh, Manny, do you want me also to answer the question on the Q and A, or you want me? Oh yeah, I think that would be good. So I believe for the Q and A, one of the questions was, uh, did you ever try this optimization approach with the super efficient plasmid? So yes, we did it. Uh, this is the plasmid uh, I took uh, as another reference, and uh, it was giving very high yield also. So this plasmid, it's uh, optimized in a way that they have a strong promoter, it's a longer mRNA, so it's probably more stable, and it's a DGFP instead of SFGFP. So it was really bright, and it gave uh, 10 times higher yield than the, with my plasmid. But in fact, with both of them, I tested the maximum, comp the best composition and the worst composition, and it was increasing in a similar way. So in fact, they can both be used and uh, probably one is the, the optimized plasmids can be better because you will have a brighter signal, but the, the, the method would be the same, the approach would be the same. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question for you. Uh, what was the purpose of training 25 different neural, neural network models for yield prediction? So what we wanted to know is to, to know the, how, um, how good, how, no, how, how can I? So I'm not the machine learning expert, but I know this answer. It's just that uh, we wanted the standard deviation in our prediction. We wanted to know how good the model was at knowing what it was predicting. So what we wanted is to have the same network uh, trying to give the same prediction. And if all the time it gives the same value, 
we knew that uh, this this composition was uh, pretty accurately um, uh, known by the the model. Well, he was able to. It was not an unknown area. He, he was able to give us a precise value. Then, was this value good or not? It was another issue. But at least there is no noise in the prediction. But if you have a very high standard deviation, you know that your model is guessing more than predicting, and so it was uh, used as um, as the exploration part of our approach. When we had a very bad standard deviation, we were asking the model to give us the composition in order for us to measure it and to be able to have a better prediction for next time. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another one here. How, how is your approach, is your approach, or rather, how is your approach applica applicable to microreactors or microfluids? Ah, uh, so for microreactors, I don't, I don't know. And for microfluidics, I, I'm not, uh, it's something that I would like to explore at some point. Perhaps you can encapsulate cell-free in liposomes, and so use it in microfluidics. But there is also a chamber in which you can uh, you can measure in parallel a lot of different compositions. So this could be a similar approach as the one with the uh, plates. But for me, it's more complicated for the moment. I didn't try that. But I mean, if you can measure a lot of different compositions in parallel, if it's in microfluidics, it's working well too. The thing is that if you want to go to bioreactors and you want higher volumes, it will be way more expensive. The advantage here with the echo and the plates is that you can go to very low volumes. And uh, so I, I saw that you can even do one microliter reaction. So with one um, batch of lysets, you can do a lot of reaction. For example, here I did, I did a thousand and I needed two liters of culture. But if I have decrease the volume, I could have done way more. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another one asking if you could expand a little on the ML algorithm stack. Well, all neural networks with are all neural networks with different architectures. So I know that there are not, but I cannot explain more. <laughs> I'm more the biologist of the, of the project and it's Matip Kosh. Uh, I can, uh, I can give you, but you, you have, um, I, I send, um, I, I will post the link to all the codes that we put online, online if you want to, to look at it. Uh, I think I cannot, uh, I try to put it in the QA. I Oh, did I uh, check a box? Okay. Because now I cannot send anything to the Q&A. But... Oh, yeah, Q&A is only for uh, answering the questions. Oh, you'll have to send the link to the chat box. Uh, but if you want, there is a bioarchive paper, and there is a, the GitHub link to all our codes. So you can really go there if you want to. All right, I believe we have one more question for you. Uh, have you tried other E. coli strains than BL21? Uh, for example, no. the traditional strains used for cell-free expression, E. coli strains KC6 or A19? No, I, I just used the DH5 alpha in order to to go in a to really challenge the, the approach. But the only two that I use is BL21 and DH5 alpha. So I didn't use the other one. But I think it should... Uh, the method, the machine learning approach, which still works, but I don't know the results that you will obtain with that. All right, thank you. And we do have a couple of questions for Sohela here. Uh, can you use any type of plate with the echo? Thank you for the question. Um, so for the source plate, we have a specified echo qualified source plates to ensure of high accuracy and precision of acoustic transfers. For the destination plate, any SBS automation friendly destination plate would work. All right, thank you. And uh, we have another one here. Can the echo also be used to transfer live cells? 
That's a great question. Um, yes, we are transferring these bacterial cell cultures for culinaring in synthetic biology, and we are able to transfer any other cells. The drops are big enough that the cells easily fit in them. Yeah. All right, thank you. I believe that's all the questions we currently have. Uh, I mean, uh, once again, thank you to Sohail and Olivier for pre presenting on a uh, cell free. I'm sorry, I must have cut out there, but uh, for uh, presenting on cell free protein production and how to optimize them. Thank you very much, Ronnie. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, really appreciate this.